And is the rationale then, Gary, that certain, again, phenotypes of people will be more sort of responsive to this? Because, you know, obviously we see in whether it's bodybuilding or sport, various other things, high carbohydrate intakes and, and, and leanness and good metabolic health. But, you know, we also see a swath of the population that obviously are struggling with weight gain, two thirds of the population overweight or obese. We've got this pre-diabetes epidemic. Are we, is it that swath that this is more relating to versus the, you know, the whole population? That's one of the fundamental observations. We know that <clears throat> We can take an entire population, any population we want, add Western diets to whatever they were eating. And that's, you know, sugar, flour, alcohol, seed oils for those people who, you know, and some people get obese and diabetic and other people won't. Just like we could take an entire population give them cigarettes and set them to smoking and some people get lung cancer and some people won't. And there may actually be a way to genetically determine who manifests the lung cancer phenotype, but nobody bothers to look because we know we can blame it on cigarettes. So here the idea is, yeah, there's a certain segment of the population that gets bigger with each generation, which we can probably should discuss and as part of this carbohydrate insulin model, um, that you know, manifest the obese diabetic phenotype in a carbohydrate, sugar, high G glycemic load, high sugar environment, and a segment of the population that doesn't. The problem is the segment that doesn't often become, they become the bodybuilders and the physical trainers and the athletes. And because they're working out so hard and so dedicated to being fit, they assume that if everyone did like they did, they would be fit also, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a marathon runner and you're lean, it's easy to assume that if everyone ran marathons, they would be lean too. And if they're not lean, it's also easy to assume that they're not lean because they don't put in the effort that you do running marathons. What you don't think about is that your body is, you know, that. A metaphor I used in my last book is um, actually maybe all of them. You know, it's like a greyhounds thinking that if they could just get the basset hounds to run around the track, the basset hounds would look like greyhounds. And what you get is emaciated, exhausted basset hounds. But not for a second do you end up with anything that looks like a greyhound because they're different animals or different phenotypes. So you add that the ideas, you add these carbohydrates to the diet, you, a certain segment of the population can't tolerate them and they manifest this obese diabetic phenotype. And then, which is, you know, at its heart, an insulin resistant phenotype. And when the women in this segment become pregnant, um, if they are insulin resistant during pregnancy, so if they gain a lot of weight during pregnancy, if they just, if they have an abnormal glucose tolerance test, that all of it is a sign of insulin resistance. If they're gestationally diabetic, which is insulin resistance, then they will pass this on, this sort of accentuate this phenomena in their children. And again, there are very good studies done, particularly with the Native American tribe, the Pima in Arizona, showing how this phenotype is magnified with each generation. You get more and more of them very quickly with each generation. Interesting. And with, you know, within those additional parameters, you talk about those other dietary components, you mentioned fructose, you know, in the paper, in the article, you talk about obviously protein and fatty acid type fiber even things like food order within the meal, um, environmental exposures, you know, can you touch on some more that can be contributing in a meaningful way, potentially? Well, the way I think about it, and I may not be the best person to interview, is that I think it's relatively simple. You know, again, in, in the course of doing the research for good calories, bad calories, I had an opportunity that most scientists don't have, which is I could move from discipline to discipline to discipline. And in... Everywhere I went, there were people <clears throat> implicating just the carb content to the diet and how it had changed and its effect primarily on insulin, or you could say insulin glucagon ratio or insulin glucagon and growth hormone. Um, the um, 
my gut feeling has always been that it's the glycemic index and the like I said, the sweetness, the sugar content and, and sugar, sugary beverages might be fundamental to all of this. They might have to sort of trigger the initial insulin resistance. And there was uh, significant research in animals. You never know what that means, whether it can be extrapolated to humans. But the easiest way to create insulin resistance in animals is to feed them high sugar diets. Um, so... I'm not sure how much yet the role of fiber would be to slow down the digestion, sort of lower the glycemic load and the glycemic index. Um, when you're eating fiber rich foods, you're not eating sugar rich foods, you're not drinking Coca Cola. <laughs> and so there are a lot of, you know, one of the issues with the way we fund science since the 1950s is the National Institutes of Health will fund virtually everyone to do a little bit of research. So they have no mechanism by which to target major problems and say, we need to have a sort of Manhattan project approach to funding this. We're gonna pick you know, very good scientists to assess the data and determine which projects should be maximally funded and just fund five projects instead of 3000. Mm -hmm. What they do instead is they fund, you put in proposals and people accept the proposals and you end up with a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of, sort of trivial to bad science and generating a whole lot of hypotheses that are never tested. And then you end up with this idea that these are complex multifactorial problems because your research enterprise has thrown up, you know. A lot of flags. Yeah, a lot of dozens, thousands of possible. And they're all, any single one of them might be valid, mm -hmm. but you don't know. When you, again, if you do the kind of exercise I do where you spend this time in the history of the field, you know, you had people in the early 19th century saying obesity rates are exploding and sugar consumption is exploding, or diabetes rates actually at the time, not obesity, and maybe there's a coincidence. And then you had people in India saying diabetes rates are exploding and sugar consumption is exploding in the population in which the diabetes rates are exploding. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a connection. So it's sort of, um, it's yeah. a lot of evidence to indict these, the sugar and the high glycemic index carbohydrates in you know, as the triggers of obesity. And then again, working through these peripheral physiological mechanisms, not just by making people eat too much. Yeah, it often goes unnoticed that uh, India is sort of the leader in, in type two diabetes around the world. We often think that the USA is uh, holding that title, but not, uh, not at this point. And, you know, if we circle back to glycemic load, you know, once we start adding protein and fiber and other nutrients, it does get pretty challenging to actually calculate, you know, glycemic load. No, so how, how might that be? you know, a testable hypothesis. Is there technology well, there coming ways, down the road or are there ways to do it? No, there are ways to, to test all these things. You, the problem is, okay, so <clears throat> disorders like obesity and type 2 chronic disorders develop slowly. So one way to think about scientific experiments is they ask specific questions and you only get the answer to the question you ask. So is the question, how does glycemic load influence body fat independent of how much I eat, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Um, it might not be independent of how much I eat. The higher glycemic index foods might also trigger me want to eat more of the higher glycemic index foods, which I think they do. But the first question we want to know is what's the role of the glycemic index independent of the caloric content mm -hmm. on fat mass? So it takes a while to accumulate a noticeable amount of fat mass. And I can't just tell people to eat a high GI diet versus a low GI diet, because then I don't know if they've done it or not. Remember when we started this conversation, I said, you can't make a single assumption that's untested because as soon as you do, you'll get the wrong answer. So if I assume I can tell people to eat this versus that, and they will, and then when I publish the study, how did I know they actually did? Mm -hmm. Science isn't about taking things on faith. So you end up realizing that in order to do these studies, you have to do it long enough to accumulate significant fat mass, assuming your hypothesis is right. And you don't know what significant fat mass is. Is it a pound over two months or is it a quarter pound over two months? Is it 10 pounds over two months? Um, 
And then you have to make sure that they eat the food you've given them and no more nor less. So it's not even enough to just give them food because they might eat the food you gave them and then go out and have a Coca-Cola or a Gatorade at 7-Eleven. So now you have to kind of lock them away. Sounds like a metabolic ward study. To be and now you've there. got a metabolic <laughs> ward study. So these now you're paying hospital bed fees in effect to keep your patients subjects in your study. So that could be $1,500, $2,000 a night plus everything else you're doing. And then you have to keep them there long enough to see a significant change on body fat. You have to make sure they only eat the foods that you give them and nothing else. So you can't have, you know, a door in your laboratory that's unlocked that leads to the au bon pain in your basement, for instance, because you don't know if maybe when you're not looking, they're going down to the au bon pain and having a croissant when they should be eating the egg bites. Um, all these things complicate science enormously and they make it very expensive. You can do it a lot cheaper by doing these experiments in rats or mice, but then you don't know if they have any relevance to humans. Translate to humans, yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of what you end up with is again, a lot of people doing a lot of pieces of experiments sort of facets, things that could possibly be useful experiments if they lasted, say, three months longer, or if they had mm -hmm. better control of the diet, or if they differed. Um, they can be tested, though. All these hypotheses can be tested. They just need the will to test them, the ability to come up with experiments that are rigorously controlled, but that an institutional review board will still consider ethical, <laughs> and the money to pay for them. Um, and all of these are in short supply. So it's sort of, um, you end up with a lot of people arguing on Twitter about the value of experiments that are fundamentally incapable of determining what we want, need to know.